introduce our first uh, guest speaker of the night. I have the honor, honor of introducing uh, Representative Jared Olson. Uh, Representative Olson is a small business owner and attorney in Cheyenne, Wyoming. He is currently serving House District 11 and is up for re-election next week. So thank you, Jared, for taking the time out in this crazy busy time to join us tonight. Um, Representative Olson has been a strong conservative advocate for the repeal of the death penalty in Wyoming. Uh, his writings on this topic has appeared in the Crime Report, the New York Times, and I think at this point, probably every single newspaper in the state of Wyoming. So uh, Representative Olson, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and I will hand it off to you. Cool. Thanks, Jordan, for the opportunity to, uh, actually, it's a great opportunity to do something, um, I shouldn't say other than campaign, but uh, that's been my life for several months now. So to be able to um, to do something very strictly policy, I, uh, I welcome that opportunity. Of course, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, as you noted, I've, I've written a lot about it and um, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. I spent a lot of time um, talking to folks across Wyoming about it. So um, just really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, as noted, I'm, I am up for reelection. I serve uh, in the House of Representatives uh, in downtown Cheyenne, for anyone who's not familiar with where House District 11 is. I have twice sponsored legislation to repeal the death penalty. Our first uh, effort was in a non-budget session and it came real close. Uh, the difference is, I will say, not my chamber. My chamber's pretty solid on this. The House of Representatives, very solid. The Senate, we're working on them to get them there. Um, and that's, you know, that's a collective effort with folks uh, that are tuning in tonight and folks uh, around the state. That's a, how we, if this is a topic that interests you, uh, whether you're a stakeholder outside of the state of Wyoming or just a, a stakeholder in Wyoming or a citizen in Wyoming, that's the way that you can, you can really make a difference is by contacting your Senator and your representative directly to discuss with them uh, your thoughts, your opinions on the death penalty, why it should be repealed. And, and uh, if they are your representative or Senator, uh, tell them how to vote because that's how it works. For me, I want to quickly note that um, um, what, what I really liked seeing in Wyoming is, is um, one general growth uh, around the topic in general uh, support for repeal of the topic, but particularly in the, in the camp of, of conservatives. Uh, because it's not traditionally the, the camp um, where you might find repeal efforts. And uh, I come from that camp. I'm a conservative. So um, I like to speak about it from, from at least my, my, my walk of life and my point of view. I'm a fiscal conservative and a social conservative. To me, I believe in limited government. I believe that government, in all that it does, it should strive to be as limited as possible. And so, especially in an area of criminal justice, um, and particularly in an area of life, uh, there's probably no area more important that, it, that, we, that we ensure that, uh, that it is limited. Um, I also think that uh, government should spend our dollars wisely. In Wyoming, we're facing a budget crisis. We have done uh, great work over the last few months to narrow that budget crisis for Wyoming, but it's still pretty significant. And one of the Immediately, what we should be doing is looking at wasteful programs. I think that the death penalty, of course, is a wasted program. Um, I'm off, I often talk with folks about the dollars and how they actually add up. There's a lot of confusion. It seems just it seems logical at first blush that if you were to just um, uh, swiftly execute someone, that it would be less costly, I suppose, than than uh, placing someone on a life sentence. And um, the reality is that the numbers tell us that because primarily of the legal system and the appeal system, before we even get to the correction system, that no doubt it is, it is far, far cheaper uh, or inex less inexpensive, I should say, to, um, to house someone for life without parole if they are a danger to, to, to others. Um, so beyond the humanity portion of it, beyond the morality portion of it, the fiscal um, aspect of it interests me in Wyoming uh, tremendously because of our budget crisis. I think at, from a conservative standpoint, if you are a conservative, you should look at these things and you should think, you should think about limited government and whether you truly believe in that principle. Um, and if you do, 
I think it's obvious that you have to support repeal of the death penalty. The same is true for fiscal responsibility. Uh, it's not fiscally responsible to spend uh, the millions of dollars that we spend each year trying to prop up this, this broken system. And then the last part of it for me, and the most important part, yeah. is the morality portion. Yeah. Uh, as a conservative, uh, I, am, I am deeply pro-life. I believe that life comes from God. And uh, as such, I believe that life is sacred. All life is sacred. And I think that if you are a conservative and you're wrestling with this issue, uh, and you do believe that, that uh, life comes from God, uh, then you either believe that life is sacred or it's not. And I'm going to guess that if you believe that much, you believe that it's sacred. Um, and if it's sacred, then there's no greater job for government than to uh, protect life. Um, and so regardless of, of one's actions, that's a big step for, for us to say that we want our government to execute our own citizens. Now tonight in particular, I'm really excited to hear from, uh, from our main speaker, of course, Crystal Martin, in particular because as I discuss the death penalty, uh, there are only a handful of topics that the opponents of repeal bring up, um, some of which we've talked about the fiscal issues and the numbers just don't, they just don't prove what the opponents of repeal want them to prove. Um, of course, we can always talk about deterrence and, and things of that nature, but I think, I think for the most part, most Americans who at least spend even a few minutes studying the death penalty can agree that, that it is simply not a deterrence. There's nothing to support that. Um, over the course of human history than alone in America. Uh, but one topic that comes up over and over and over again in my discussions, and I heard, and I heard it in the chambers uh, in, the, in the Capitol building, is the argument that uh, victims, survivors need the death penalty because a victim's survivor cannot have justice but for the death penalty. Um, of course, I don't believe that. And um, I think... Uh, most people who believe in repeal um, don't struggle with that issue, but there is uh, no better mouthpiece uh, to champion that than a victim's survivor. And so I'm really excited to hear from Crystal Martin tonight. I think that it's important that we, especially me as a representative, I don't want to assume what the position is of any person on any policy issue. My job, of course, is to make decisions for Wyoming that I think are best for the people of Wyoming. But part of that process, and one of the most important parts of that process, is listening to my constituents, listening to our constituencies across the state of Wyoming, hearing from them and what their viewpoint is, and, and, and that impacts policy decisions greatly. And so uh, I think this is a huge piece of the conversation to hear um, not what a senator or representative or even myself thinks that victims, survivors believe or don't believe about justice, but to hear straight from uh, someone like Crystal um, on the topic. And so with that, um, I could talk all night about the death penalty, of course. Uh, it's a, like I said, it's a, it's a big topic for me. It's an important topic. Going forward, we're, look, we're moving into a session in January where I think the death penalty is going to have a lot more strength in terms of repeal than it ever has because of the budget constraints. I think more and more folks are going to warm up to the fiscal argument, but at the end of the day, it's a deeply moral issue as well. And so that's where uh, everyone participating tonight, again, can really, um, can really make a big impact uh, to discuss the, those, the humanity aspects, the morality aspects with your representative, with your senator, I think is gonna make a big difference. So with that, I will uh, hand the mic over to, uh, to Jordan or whomever, and thank you. Thank you, Representative Olson. We really appreciate you joining us. Like Jordan said, I, we know you're really busy campaigning right now, so it means a lot to us. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing Crystal tonight. I'm so excited for you guys to meet her and um, learn how um, much of an amazing person she is like I've been able to over the last few months as I've gotten closer with her. Um, and just to give you guys a little background, Crystal was born and raised in Sweetwater County and she is the executive director and co-founder of Sweetwater Against Trafficking. And she is also part of the um, um, Restorative Justice Council, sorry. Um, 
every person who Crystal comes in contact with, with and is met with a kind heart and understanding. And I think that you guys will really understand that tonight after listening to her story. Um, so Crystal, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Hey, thank you. Um, I wanna thank everybody for showing up today um, and giving me the opportunity to talk about the death penalty repeal. I've mowed this over for years and I have not only been a victim once to a violent crime, but I've also been a victim twice, one as a child and one as an adult. So I'm gonna go into a little bit about that. My mother was murdered when I was eight years old in 1993. She was kidnapped from a convenience store and raped and strangled to death and then buried in a snowdrift. It took us two weeks to find her body. Um, at that time, we found the offender because he was a repeat offender. And he was able to tell us where the body was. And he also confessed to the crime. It took about a year and a half to get through the trial. And during that time, I saw some tremendous pain throughout my family and within myself. And as an adolescent, I actually started going through my own traumatic experiences or behavioral issues because of the traumatic experiences that I had faced in my life. Uh, partly with cutting, I felt like cutting was going to take away from some of the emotional pain, but I also started underage drinking, smoking marijuana at 13 years old, and, you know, going to these insanely adult parties that could have put me in a position where I was actually, um, could have been a criminal offender myself. I was actually put into two different treatment facilities because of my behaviors. Um, they said a lot was suicidal ideations due to my post-traumatic stress disorder. So, you know, some of the childhood trauma it got me thinking of where my path was going to go and whether I was going to go down a path of destruction or if I was going to try and make a difference. And at that point in time, I chose to make a difference. Because um, statistically speaking, we know that most children with traumatic events will uh, be likely to cause serious uh, violent offenses within their adolescence to young adult phases. Um, I apologize. Sometimes this is a little hard to talk about. Um, so as an adult, uh, my husband was murdered in 2014 on October 31st. And he was shot in the head and burned in a fire pit and through the court hearings, um, we had to face a tremendous amount of re-traumatization. I apologize again. Um, partly because we were constantly battling with the victim's compensation fund. How were we gonna get reimbursed for our travels? What was going to happen in the next court hearing? Um, the first one was, you know, of course, oh, we're going to try and get a confession. And then we're going to see if he wants to trial, go to trial. Um, and because of the victim's impact or the compensation fund not getting to the funding or the uh, reimbursement that we needed, I actually didn't get to attend my husband's trial or my husband's murderer's trial, um, which he was facing 99 years with no possibility of parole. This was a man that had no prior offenses, was in a meth-induced psychosis, and had a child of his own and a wife that committed a crime based off of that meth-induced psychosis. Uh, 
Um, for me, it was never about going and fighting for the death penalty for either one of the offenders that I've had to deal with in my life. It was never about um, the death penalty with my father being able to fight for the death penalty either. Um, it was just too, too hard for any of us to really go through and the impacts of constantly having to go and fight for one thing after another, it was just awful. For me with the death penalty, I would like to see it repealed because right now for the allotted 2020 uh, monies that go towards the death penalty could be going towards services where we could do rehabilitative services for offenders prior to them causing severe violent crimes and work with our juveniles that we're seeing go into the system based off of traumatic experiences that they actually face themselves. I work with a lot of kiddos that have mental illness and trauma and they don't have an out. They don't have the rehabilitative services that they need in each county, in each town. And I fear that if we don't start putting that money towards these different programs that we can offer to youth, we're gonna see an increase in more um, in the overpopulated prison systems. And we're gonna see more individuals commit violent offenses that are going to put victims like myself in a position of having something like post-traumatic stress disorder and having to fight every day to understand a crime that they had no control over. Kylie, do you want to take over for a second? Yes, of course. Can you, can Thank you, you. Hear me? sorry, I wasn't able to mute my, or unmute myself. You're fine, Crystal. Take as much time as you need. I know that this isn't easy and um, you are doing great. So just take as much time as you need. Um, and Sarah just shared your op-ed, Crystal's op-ed that was posted in the Casper Star Tribune about two weeks ago. Um, and you can, it, it goes a little bit more into detail about her story um, and everything that she has gone through. Sorry, I for, didn't realize my video wasn't on. Um, Crystal, would it be easier if maybe, maybe we did some questions? Yeah, let's go ahead and do some questions. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So if anyone has any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat and um, and we can we can read them from there. So I um, I I'll get us started. Crystal, you did a really good job in Gillette when we were there. Um, for this, for an event about going into restorative justice and how restorative justice changed your life and you were able to forgive and start healing through restorative justice and just kind of the, the road that you went down to finding that path. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, I was a criminal justice major trying to figure out my path. I was working on um, case management and corrections so that I could work with youth. And I came across a class that they asked me to do a report on restorative justice. 
and I did this report and I was thinking, no, no, this is not going to happen. You know, this is not going to be healing. It's, you know, whatever. So I got to thinking about it a little bit more and I was like, you know what, I'm going to test this on myself. I have the perfect opportunity to do so. So I reached out to my victims coordinator here in the state of Wyoming. And uh, she explained the victim offender dialogue to me so that I could actually go and meet face to face with the offender for my mother. And it was a year of preparation of just being able to <clears throat> really process, you know, the way that this crime impacted me, whether it be as a child, as an adolescent, or as an adult. And he also was able to volunteer to be a part of this program as well. So about a year afterwards, I was able to walk into the Rollins State Penitentiary and meet with my mother's offender for about two and a half hours. And it was probably one of the most healing dynamics that I've ever had. And um, I was able to have forgiveness and understand the offender in an empathy level and as a person, when I looked at this man from across the table, I cried for him. And it was because he was a child at one point in time, that sweet, innocent child. What happened to this man? So that is what got me started on that path because I knew that as a victim, we weren't notified about these programs as we needed to be. We, um, you know, we have to seek those types of things out. And I immediately called my victim coordinator yet again, after I got done with the dialogue and asked, okay, what are we doing here in Wyoming for restorative justice? This is so healing. We need this for more victims. And prior to them being in prison, um, so that we can start getting to the root causes and start establishing that healing, not only with the victims, but the communities as well. Absolutely. And you are um, currently working on meeting with your husband's offender, correct? I am. I actually meet with him next week on the 4th. Oh my so gosh. due to COVID, we had to figure out a way to do it digitally. So through Zoom, um, so that we could still have our face-to-face -face mediation. And I'm actually really excited about this one, um, not only because it's gonna provide healing and understanding for me, but mm -hmm. it he has an opportunity for parole after 21 and a half years. So in 2037, he gets to be seen um, through the parole board and possibly have a second chance at life. So I'm hoping that not only healing for myself, but also for the offender so that, you know, he can not use the socialization that he's getting in the penitentiary, but use it as an opportunity to heal and seek understanding so that he can have a, a positive life afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's such a powerful point to make is when you, you talked about healing for yourself and he healing for him, for both offenders, really. And I think that that's something to keep in mind when the death penalty is on the table and is granted to someone. Um, there's a lot of times there's not an opportunity for that healing to take place. And we've heard from other victims, family members that once that execution has happened, they end up feeling worse because now another life is taken and there was never that opportunity for the family to heal or the offender to heal. So I think that's really powerful for you and so commendable. Your, your strength is amazing. Thank you, I appreciate it. I also wanna kind of add to that comment that you had talked about with, you know, when we seek the death penalty um, who are we victimizing when it comes to seeking that death penalty? Because the offenders um, have families, you know, in my husband's offenders 
case. He had a five-year-old child that he had to leave behind in order to go to prison. And what would that do to that little girl if her dad was actually put on death row and sentenced at some point to die? I mean, then that re-victimizes them, even though they're also victims of the crime itself. So I think we need to really think about that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. Looks like we have a question. We've got a couple of questions. I'll start with the one that's directed towards Crystal. It says, um, Crystal, I'm wondering if you've been able to expand restorative justice programs and victim services in Wyoming. What role has faith and spirit spirituality played for you in the healing process and our legislators listening? Can we repeat that question? Yeah, sorry, that was, that was a lot. <laughs> so what role, um, or let's start with the first part of it. Um, if you've been able to expand restorative justice programs and victim services in Wyoming. So through the Wyoming Restorative Justice Council, we are actually working to expand the knowledge base um, for restorative justice. And we're trying to really work with some of the juvenile programs. So like single point of entry and help them establish. But unfortunately, the biggest complaint that we hear throughout the state when we do these um, these open sessions is, well, what about the funding? Mm -hmm. um, we don't have enough funding. If we start a program and then we lose the funding, we have to end the program. So it does no good. Um, so I think that there are a lot of community-based programs um, especially in a juvenile probation that are having a hard time really wanting to start those programs because of the lack of funding and the lack of legislation that's on restorative justice as well. Yeah, and that, that's a good point. Uh, Representative Olson brought up the fiscal impact of the death penalty earlier, and I think it's important to note that even though we don't currently have anyone on death row in Wyoming and we haven't executed anyone since 1992, taxpayers are still paying every year just to have the death penalty as a law on the books. So if we were to repeal the death penalty, the funds that, we're, that are going towards that taxpayer's money could be going towards programs like Crystals for restorative justice or towards programs that actually keep our community safe, because um, we know that the death penalty isn't a deterrent of crime. Um, the second part of that question was, what role has faith and spirituality played for you in the healing process? So faith was not a big thing for me when I was an adolescent. I had lost my faith. Um, I had always had a testimony of course, of, you know, being grateful for Jesus dying on the cross for us and being able to repent for those sins. Um, it wasn't until after I went to the first parole hearing for my mother's offender that I was, you know, I was playing this in my head, oh, I forgive him. And then I got on the parole board meeting and was telling the parole board this and got off the phone. And I felt so terrible because I had lied about being able to forgive this man. I realized it because my emotions were boiling over and I sat in the shower for two hours thinking, oh my gosh, how could I just convince myself this? Um, this isn't true forgiveness. You can't convince yourself to truly forgive. You actually have to go through steps and learn how to cope through it mm -hmm. and work through those hard questions in order for us to truly forgive. So I started going back to my upbringing in um, my family through religion. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, how could Jesus forgive those that nailed him to the cross and threw stones at him and, you know, tortured him and watched him as he had no water and no food. How could he forgive those people that victimized him personally? So I started asking myself questions about, you know, what would Jesus do? What are we supposed to do as individuals, um, 
through the Bible and through our teachings spiritually. And I knew that I was only going to be forgiven as much as I forgive and that I had to really follow my religious perspective on that. And it, it helped me a tremendous amount. Yeah, that's powerful. Um, I've got another question that was sent to me privately. Do you feel that the legal system does more to punish offenders or provide healing for the victims um, or survivors? For me or for somebody else? For you, yeah. Um, so I feel that we're doing more to punish. We are not taking care of the underlying causes and treating those. We're just, okay, you know what? It's a stray dog or, you know, a, a criminal offender that we're going to just put away because that's going to do the trick. We're not giving any kind of rehabilitative services to help them cope and move through life and reintegrate into society when we are allowing them to go on parole or probation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before we move on to the next question for Crystal, I want to go back to this one that was directed at Representative Olson before I forget. Um, it says, will the upcoming election possibly increase the chances of a 2021 bill passing the Senate? It, thanks. If I had a, a crystal ball, I'd probably be a much wealthier man, but um, and successful in legislating too. Not that I'm not successful, just more successful. Um, that's, that's, it's a really, it's a super interesting question because the um, well, there's still one seat um, that's undecided that on November 3rd will be decided. That seat, if the incumbent loses, would absolutely be a plus one vote for repeal. Um, so there's some there's some silver lining there. We lost one um, member who was in the Senate who was both a co-sponsor and um, a vote for repeal and replaced with somewhat of an unknown, but probably a known op opponent of repeal. Two of the Senate seats that changed, I see them as a wash. Um, so they were um, no repeal votes that were replaced with most likely no votes. And by my account, there's one unknown. So what does that mean? It means when we send the bill over to the Senate, we fell short by only four votes, so super close. Um, with an unknown and a possible gain, it could be very, very tight, very close. Um, the, you know, the way deliberative bodies sometimes work is that the closer the vote is, the more your swing votes make up their mind to go with something that they may be inching towards, but they're nervous to step out in front of it. And the Senate only has 30 people in it. So, so four seems really tight, but when you only have 30, that's actually a pretty, pretty decent spread. Um, but if, you know, if, if there's this gain plus this unknown and it's within two votes, I think some people who have been thinking about this for four years may, may very well change their minds. Of course, all of the stakeholders um, well beyond me are working very hard to communicate with these senators and help educate them. And um, I think that something like this probably has more impact, honestly, than, than elections will ever have. Hearing, you know, Crystal's uh, testimony is heart-wrenching for me and, and I've already made up my mind. So, uh, and just, and I've heard, I've heard so many people of, um, I should say so many non-lay people of faith speak of biblical teachings, but to hear someone who um, is not um, a pastor or a priest or whatever, um, apply their, you know, like you, you just did, Crystal, apply your faith and your teachings to your decision. Um, if I'm a man or a woman of faith and I'm listening to you say that, I don't know how that can't have a huge impact on my decisions. So with that, my decision, my, my conclusion is it's up in the air, but it's still awfully close. 
Thank you, Representative Olson. It looks like we have another question. I don't know if um, if this who this is directed at, but I'm just going to ask it to Representative Olson. Do you think that the growing movement to repeal on the state level will affect the federal stand on capital punishment? Absolutely. So I am many times, I have many times been asked, what's the, what are you trying to accomplish, Jared? What's the point? Well, one, obviously I want to get rid of the death penalty, but we, when we started our adventure four years ago, there was no individual on death row. Um, through the appeal process, you know, we're, we, we, that's changed just in the last year. But when we started, there was no one. And Wyoming doesn't have a, a lengthy history of execution. And so the question often came up, you know, um, what, what is it going to change in Wyoming? And honestly, I have argued um, over the course of the years, as I'm arguing for repeal, that, that Wyoming really has repealed its death penalty by and large because it doesn't use it. And it's not just that we don't have um, heinous crimes that may bring about a capital um, charge or a capital case. In fact, it's the, it, it's the opposite. And we, our research tells us that just over the last um, decade, we've had at least 14 cases that were all capital cases and they were either settled um, outside of um, going to a trial um, without a death penalty, obviously, as the, as the settlement. Or if they went all the way to a conviction and a jury, the jury actually nullified it, basically nullified the death penalty, the, um, the juries rejected it. So that's pretty significant because it, it tells us that um, a lot about, um, through juries, how people in Wyoming actually feel about the death penalty when they're faced to make the real choice um, on, 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 on what its impact is. And so all of that said, um, often in my mind, at least the, what my response to a lot of those folks is that Wyoming has an opportunity to have a huge impact on the national stage, the global stage and far beyond um, our geographic boundary um, here in Wyoming. That, you know, if we have one case every couple of decades it doesn't seem like we make a huge difference by repealing it, but for a state that is so deeply red, um, you know, regardless of your national politics, one that in the four years ago uh, had the highest percentage vote for President Donald Trump than any other state. So it's deeply, deeply red. So for it to take a position on something like death penalty and repeal it, I think, um, I think that creates a tremendous momentum for other red states or other, you know, light red states, definitely deep red states, um, to take a huge stance on it. And you know, just for Wyoming, you know, I think it speaks to our history, our history of being a state of firsts, to being a progressive state, to being the equality state. All of these things, um, I think, sometimes we get lost in the Western states and what we think they are in America. Um, whether that's labeled as backwoods or whatever it may be, but Wyoming is, is far from any of that. And to repeal it would, would I think, send a very strong message across the country that, um, that we are not those, those stereotypes. Um, and I think, that will help, I think that will help a lot of states in the South, um, in particular where the death penalty um, is a true issue is in the deep South. And that's where I think Wyoming's influence could be impactful. Absolutely. I agree with that, Representative. And I, um, it's important to note, too, that if we repeal in this upcoming legislative session, Governor Gordon will be the first Republican governor to ever sign a repeal bill, which it would be huge. And I think that that would also send a very clear message to other red states as well. Um, Crystal, there is a request to... Um, Describe restorative justice in other aspects, other just just other than just the one that we've already talked about, um, such as when the community as a whole is seen as the harmed victim. Okay, um, so I'm still becoming very familiar with the different dynamics um, of restorative justice and the different avenues. Um, 
we have talked about doing community peace circles in order to help heal the communities that are impacted by um, whatever harms could be caused. I know that when we talk about the juvenile system, we're talking about, you know, doing a circle in order to help the juvenile be able to repair the harms in which they've caused to the community, to the people involved, whether it be investigations, um, school personnel, whatever the case may be, so that they can repair harms to each of the individuals that are a part of that circle. Um, I have talked with several different communities as well, community leaders, um, about doing um, circle processes to discuss city and community issues to help their voices be heard and hopefully come to a conclusion on how to fix those issues within the community. I know right now, one of the big things with restorative justice is the issue with oppression and the whether you are a person of color, whether you are a person in poverty, whether you are a person with a traumatic past, um, how does restorative aspects help with the oppression? when we are founded on a very oppressive system. Um, and so that is something that is being discussed as well. And I know that there is a group that is working on that in Fremont County. Great, thank you. Let's see, I think I covered the questions that we've got in the chat. Um, and I just I wanted to clarify too, I, I know I said it earlier, but I think it's important to remember that we currently don't have anyone on death row right now. And like I said earlier, we haven't executed anyone since 1992. Um, so it's like Representative Olson said, we've we've basically already repealed the death penalty in Wyoming, but but it, unfortunately it still exists and we're still paying for it as taxpayers. Um, there was a comment that I think Margie made that what right does the government have to make a killer out of a dedicated citizen in our correction system in regards to um, the government puts other individuals in the position of having to carry out an execution. And I think that that's a really important aspect to think of as well, especially as we're talking about trauma. And I, I mean, I can't, I can't even imagine how traumatic that is. And we, we did a couple events last year as the, the campaign to end the death penalty. Um, we did film screenings of a film called Lindy Lou Juror Number Two. And she, Lindy Lou, sat on a jury trial for a death penalty case. And throughout the documentary, it talks about how it, how it really affected her and how it really traumatized her going through that trial. Um, so I think that that's another important aspect to think of when thinking of the death penalty is that it's not just the individual that's being executed that's affected and the victim's family members, it's, it's a lot. And then you, you have the wardens and the prisons, um, the individuals that, that carry out the executions, the jurors, um, everyone in the legal system that's involved in that trial, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot and it, it can be very, very traumatic for those individuals. Do we have any other questions that we'd like to ask Representative Olson or Crystal? So um, before we wrap up, I am going to share a little bit about the campaign. I, I've talked about it a little bit. Um, so the, the Wyoming campaign to end the death penalty is a very diverse campaign. I, my, I myself am on it. Um, the ACLU of Wyoming, Jordan with the Wyoming Interfaith Network, Crystal is also on it. 
um, the League of Women Voters, the Catholic Conference. There's there's a wide variety of us that are make up this campaign. And um, if you would like to get involved, I will put the link to our website to join the campaign in the chat. Um, you can also use this website as a tool to find facts about the death penalty. Um, you can learn more about the campaign, get involved, and then there's also resources on there as well. Um, and you, you can also sign up to get, if you'd like to have us speak in your area or uh, host a virtual event like we have tonight, you can also do that through the website as well. So it's a really good source um, to, oh, thank you, Jordan. Um, it's a really good source to get in contact with us and learn about what we're doing around the state. We will continue to do learning events like this leading up to session. Um, like everyone has mentioned, please reach out to your legislators. It's really important, especially leading up to the election next week. It's really important that you contact your legislators and you get them on the books about where they're at on the death penalty. Um, voices, hearing from constituents and hearing your voices is going to be really powerful coming up in this next legislative session. And we're so close. We, like Representative Wilson said, we are almost there, but we just need a little bit more of a push. And I think that everyone on here tonight can help us get there. So thank you again so much for joining us. Um, appreciate everyone taking time out of their evenings and away from their families to join us tonight. And a huge shout out and thank you to Crystal for sharing your story. I know that it's not easy and you are always so gracious and graceful and I couldn't say more amazing things about you. So thank you again so much for everything. Thank you for having me. Um, also, one one other thing before I forget is our Facebook page is also a really great resource to find upcoming events and other things that we're doing. We post on there a lot. So it's at YO, um, YONDP, I think, is our Facebook handle as well. So thank you guys again so much. Hey, and I just wanted to also give a shout out. Thanks to Crystal. I just, I can't praise you enough for the, the courage that it takes to come and, and share your story that is so deeply personal. And, um, you know, it's might be hard to believe, but lawmakers are people too. And I really think at the end of the day, um, even though decisions sometimes, most of the time seem like they're made with numbers and rationale and reasoning and all these things, at the end of the day, we're just people. And I think most people are impacted more than anything by the human experience and by relationships and these types of things. So um, what you're doing, Crystal, is, is just earth moving uh, from Wyoming. So really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate everyone who tuned in tonight as well. I love seeing uh, the engagement and just seeing how many people actually care about this issue. So, and thanks for having me as well. Thank you. Jordan, did we cover everything or is there anything else we need I to think, go over? I think we, we covered it. Um, okay. Thanks thanks again to everybody for joining. I, I'll drop just once again um, a faith leader sign-on letter in the chat that you can share. Um, if you yourself consider yourself a faith leader or if you could share that within your own community, that would be incredible. Um, we just really want to get critical mass of folks um, showing that Wyomingites um, care about justice and we care for our neighbors. So um, just make sure you share all the information that you have tonight. And if you have any questions, I know that you can always contact um, me or Kylie and I'll go ahead and throw Jared in there and Crystal as well. We're happy to um, follow up and answer any questions that, that people may have. Absolutely. All right. Uh, well, thank you guys. I'm just reading through the through the chats, making sure I'm haven't missed anything. I think we're good. So thank you guys again and uh, look forward to hopefully hearing from some of you guys on the call tonight. We'd love to have you um, join the campaign. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.